Hey everybody, it's your girl Herbal Farm Sister. Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's broadcast. I'll give everybody a few minutes to uh, sign in. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome, that's awesome. Good evening, Keith. Good evening, D. All right, so this evening I'm holding this free gardening session to help people uh, that may want to start a garden this year and have no clue where to start and you know what things they may encounter and things like that. So I thought I would just do this free session this Sunday. Um, if you need further help after this, I offer classes and things like that that you can enroll in. <clears throat> All right, a little bit about myself for those of you that do not know me. My name is Nadia Ruffin. I'm located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I'm an entomologist, a scientist, farmer, researcher, educator, and I uh, retired from being a disease investigator. Um, I have two degrees. I have a degree, a bachelor's degree in agriculture from the Ohio State University. And then I also have a master's of science in entomology from the University of Nebraska. I'm owner uh, and founder of Kiwi Produce and Agri-Academy Inc. I'm co-owner of Agri-Academy Labs. I um, have years of experience in floriculture. My family actually owned a flower shop here in Cincinnati. Um, and so I'm very uh, experienced in that area. Um, then I also have a background in veterinary medical research. Uh, for over 15 years, I worked in uh, veterinary uh, and medical research doing different types of experiments and things. Uh, a lot of them were deep disease studies and things like that. Then I also was a disease investigator with uh, Hamilton County Public Health here in Cincinnati, um, where I would investigate disease outbreaks similar to the one that, you know, we're experiencing now with the COVID-19. So I'd like to thank all my contributors. I've had a lot of people donate. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for supporting this channel. Uh, if you'd like to support my channel, you can do so by uh, sending um, payments to PayPal. That's NadiaRuffin at gmail.com cash app at uh, Nadia Ruffin, or you can use my Patreon. You become a patron. It's $5 a month. Uh, you can go to patreon.com forward slash urban farm sister. Also, if you like to support Agri-Academy Inc., the nonprofit, um, uh, you can do so by visiting our website at www.agriacademyinc.org. Um, we have a lot of research projects coming up, as well as we just completed our Black Empowerment Through Agriculture program. Um, it was a program that we had created to teach, uh, particularly wanted to focus on uh, Black people that lived here in the Cincinnati tri-state area, but uh, we had some other people outside the area actually enroll. Basically, it was eight weeks, and they learned uh, about 16 different industries that they could actually uh, start a business or start an agribusiness or actually start farming in. Um, so we completed that last week. We had 159 students enrolled. Um, to be considered, you had to be a minimum of 10 years of age. Uh, you must identify as Black or African American. Um, you must either live in the Cincinnati Tri-State area or you could be outside of it. And uh, all the classes took place online. So now that we completed the class, um, the students that live here in the region uh, that score high, because we had quizzes and we had homework assignments and things that they had to do, uh, they'll be actually selected to work on our urban farm and they'll, you know, learn how to actually start a business in agriculture. 
Um, but we'll have another class coming up soon. Uh, if you'd like to enroll, um, you need to visit our website and sign up for our um, wait list. So that's www.agricademyinc.org forward slash beta wait list. All right, so tonight we're gonna to talk about some different types of gardens. We're gonna talk about how to start a garden, talk about nutrients, lighting, pH, uh, plants that grow well in one season, talk about hand pollination, and then we'll do some, I'm gonna do some demonstrations and I'll also take some questions. Any questions before we get started? Awesome, Keith. All right, so there's different types of gardens. Uh, depending on the space you have available, uh, this will decide what type of garden that you're going to actually set up. So there's in-ground. We'll talk about what that is. There's raised beds. And then there's also container gardens. Uh, how long is the session? Keith, the... Uh, hold on. So Keith wants to know how long is the session for the Black Empowerment through Agriculture. It is eight weeks long. Um, and it will meet twice a week. We were meeting Monday, Wednesday, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It was usually supposed to last in about an hour, but a lot of the classes were lasting about an hour and a half because people had questions and, you know, they, they were really involved in things in, in, in the uh, actual class. Um, but it, um, it usually, it, like, like I said, it lasts eight weeks. We'll cover 16 different industries that you can pursue a either farming in or start an agribusiness in. You'll learn how to write up a uh, business plan um, and then we'll have like assignments and you'll have quizzes that are done online and things like that. <clears throat> All right. So as I was saying, there's different types of gardens. There's in-ground raised bed and container gardens and depending on the space you have available, decide which one you're going to actually uh, use. So in-ground gardens, soil is tilled. Uh, soil should be tested for nutrient levels, chemicals, uh, you know, different things that can be present in the soil that may affect either your plant's health or even your health as well. Um, this is the easiest form of gardening. Uh, there's no building of boxes. Uh, you can use a small area or more, but it's very labor intensive. Um, like I said, you're going to have to till it, get it ready to be planted, and then uh, you've got to deal with things like weeds unless you're going to put like some type of uh, um, lawn fabric and things to block weeds out. Um, but it can be very labor intensive. Um, you may even have to clear the area before you can actually utilize it as a in-ground uh, garden. So then there's raised beds. Um, Basically, a bed is built. There are many different materials that are used. There's wood, bricks, tires, sticks. Uh, people use a lot of different things to make beds. Uh, make sure if you're using wood, it's heat treated. And be careful using materials that may leach chemicals into your soil that you're going to actually add to the bed. Uh, for this method, there's no digging or tilling. Basically, you're going you're gonna to build up the bed with high quality soil to begin with. Um, so you're, you're not going to have to deal with the things that would possibly, you know, prevent you from uh, setting up your garden, say, if it was in the ground. Um, you shouldn't have to even take pH because if you're using high quality soil, the pH and everything has already been adjusted. It has nutrients and things present. Um, so you should, be, you should be ready to go. Uh, many types of plants do well in raised beds. Uh, this method is used in areas where your soil is, no, is not good to use or there's no soil available at all. An example would be like someone setting up a, um, a raised bed in a parking lot where, you know, there's no soil, there's nothing but concrete, where you can build these beds, fill them with soil, and you can turn that area into a garden or even a farm. All right, so container gardens. Container gardens, uh, containers are filled with soil, plants are planted in those containers. Again, this has no digging. There's virtually it's virtually weed free. It's high quality soil is added, so you shouldn't have to be doing pHs and things at this point, especially your first year. Uh, many types of plants do well in these containers, but it's best to purchase, um, you know, dwarf plants or plants uh, that will stay small. Uh, 
this method is used by people that have limited space. So say if you live in an apartment or say you even live in a house, but you don't have a big backyard or your backyard doesn't have soil and things, you can use containers and you can, you can create a container garden. <clears throat> One thing you must note, though, is that you want to drill holes in the bottom of whatever container you use. So there's many different types of containers you can use for a container garden. Um, in this picture here at the top, we have uh, this is my friend. I helped her set up a container garden on her porch. Um, and we used a tote that she had sitting in the basement. So we drilled holes in the bottom, filled it with some soil, planted seeds in there. Everything that was in there except for the tomato plant started from seed. Um, and then she was able to actually harvest from this. She was hard. We, we had grew green beans. We had grew tomatoes. We had grew peppers in there um, and cucumbers. So, so she was throughout the whole summer, she was, you know, harvesting from that little container. All right, so starting your garden, either you're going to start your plants from seeds or you're going to start them from started plants and you're going to transplant them into the garden. <clears throat> if you're going to start from seeds, uh, basically you're going to need some supply. So you're going to need soil or, or some other type of material like coconut core, um, perlite, something to get the plant started in. You're going to need containers to start those in, labels so you know exactly what you're starting, the day you start, the date you started it. Um, the days that you transplant to new containers, uh, and then when you know you have to sit them outside and let them harden off, you need to put a date on that so they make sure you're hardening them off long enough so when they actually go outside, they don't get burned by the sun. Um, you'll need your seeds. Uh, you got to make sure the containers that you're trying to grow the seeds in can accommodate that seed's growth. Um, you don't want to put <clears throat> a, say, a zucchini plant in a uh, small, like, plug tray um, because the plants, it'll grow too big very quickly. Um, then you have to have patience. Uh, I know a lot of people, they want to rush the plants. Nature's going to grow in its own time. There's nothing you can do to speed it up. I mean, you can add certain things. You can add extra lighting and things, but it's still going to grow in its own time. Um, there are some things that can accelerate growth, uh, you know, good nutrition for your plants and things, perfect lighting, perfect environment and things will help them grow a lot faster and a lot better than like when you, once you put them outside, they're exposed to those elements that, you know, may affect their growth and things like that. Um, but you got to have patience. Things are going to grow when they want to grow. Things are going to, uh, you know, seeds are going to sprout when they want to. And if you don't have the correct conditions, that's going to prolong the seed sprouting. Uh, some plants, um, <clears throat> Some plants are what you call directly sown into the soil, which means say you're growing in the ground or you're growing in a raised bed or in a container, you could put those seeds directly in, that, in there and let them sprout out of there and they're actually, you know, in the container they're going to grow in. You don't have to transplant them. Um, a lot of those transplanted plants, you know, things like tomatoes and peppers, those are the ones you want to start early because they have a longer growing season. So you'll start those indoors and then you'll transplant those plants outdoors into your, whatever you're going to grow them in, whether it's the, the garden or soil garden, the raised bed or the uh, container garden. Um, but you want to, especially your first year, if you're trying to grow things, you want to pick things that are going to grow in one season. Um, they're going to grow fast. And I have a list of those things uh, near the end to tell you which plants will grow. You don't think you're going to get like blueberries and stuff this year. Blueberries and things grow on bushes and they take years sometimes for them to uh, start to flower and actually produce fruit. <clears throat> so some issues that people uh, encounter. Um, so how to troubleshoot those. Uh, for plants to properly grow, they need proper lighting, adequate water, the correct balance of nutrients, and the right pH. If any of uh, uh, these things are out of balance or missing entirely, your plant will quickly start to exhibit problems that can stunt growth or cause your plant to actually die. So has anybody ever encountered any problems? Has any, anybody on here that's listening, have you started gardens before and had problems in the past? Oh, um, Keith, this session is only going to be like an hour long, so it should be over by like no later than 7, 7, 15. Did you have any issues when you were starting your garden, Keith?
Um, so plants need light to grow. Uh, plants achieve their best growth under sunlight. When you decide to bring plants indoors, you need to recreate that light the plant would receive outdoors. Without proper lighting, a plant cannot carry out photosynthesis and other biological processes. Nutrients cannot be absorbed, which causes plants uh, abnormal growth. Okay, so you said, Keith said he had some problems with some vegetables. Tawana said, yes. Keith said okra did not do well. What exactly did the okra do that it didn't do well? Oops. That's covering up my words. Oh, well. Um, so lighting issues, leggy growth. So have anybody ever grown plants and, you know, you may have put them under a light. You probably had them under the wrong light or you might have sat them in a window and then you come back to check the plant and it's like this long <laughs> and it's flopping over and things like that. This is what you call leggy growth. Um, and this is due to improper lighting. So this improper lighting, uh, it could be that you, you're, you're using the wrong type of light. Um, it, it could be that you don't have the light close enough. If you have your plants in the window, you could have them in the wrong type of window. And we're going to go through all of these issues. But leggy growth is not something that you want because this is when your plant is starting out. If it doesn't have a good start, it's not going to it's not going to finish good either. It's, it usually it'll just die. It'll die because it's not getting the adequate lighting that it needs. Or you might have plants that, you know, if, if you have them in a in a window or you have them in a room but you don't have them under a light, you'll see them like leaning a certain way. So they're leaning towards that light so that they can get that light that they need to carry out, you know, their biological processes. But if it can't get that light, the plant's going to suffer. It's going to keep getting longer and longer, and then eventually it'll flop over. And then you got to start the seeds over because that plant's just not going to do well. All right. So what are some causes? Incorrect lighting. Uh, you cannot use incandescent lighting uh, light. So those are like your lamps in your house and things. You cannot use those. Those are not the proper lighting that the plant would need. Um, lights with high lumen output in the correct color spectrum are what you need, and also the correct PAR. Um, vegetative growth needs to be blue or white light, which are in the 4,000K or higher. So 4,000K is the, that, um, what is that? That unit is kelvins. So light is measured in kelvins. So when you're going out and you're purchasing the light, um, what you'll notice is it'll have a, a number on there. So if you're trying to get plants to uh, sprout from seed, first thing you're going to look at is what type of light lighting do you have? It's going to have to be in the blue or white spectrum. If it's not in the blue or white spectrum, your seeds are not going to sprout. Um, so you're going to pick lights. It could be a warm, warm metal halide. These are different types of grow lights. It could be fluorescent lights. It could also be... Um, um, a clear metal halide. You notice I didn't say LEDs. So LEDs, there are LED grow lights, but LEDs do not start your plants out uh, when you're trying to sprout those seeds. You do not want to use an LED light, a grow light. They're not going to give off the proper heating that the seeds need um, and, and different things, and they're not made for sprouting. A lot of them will say it on there, do not use to start seedlings. You can use them after the seedlings have developed their first sets of leaves. You can switch out that light and allow it to grow after that. But you do not use LED light to start seeds. It's going to stunt the growth. Um, the plants are going to look funny. They might even look stretched because you might not even have the right colors. Uh, a lot of LEDs, they come in these different colors and things. And a lot of times they don't even explain on the packaging like what light spectrum is needed for what? And so people just buy them because either they're cheap or, you know, they don't know what they're doing. They didn't ask anybody and they went and bought these lights and then they put their plants under there and then the plant struggle. Um, but that's the first thing. If you're going to start, if you're going to start seedlings indoors and you don't have like a greenhouse or something, you're going to have to probably purchase a fluorescent grow light. Um, they can be kind of expensive, but they'll pay off in the end because you'll have healthy plants that you'll be able to put outside and things like that. 
All right, so not enough sunlight. I know a lot of people, they'll they'll put their little seedling trays in front of a window and they'll just leave it there and they'll be like, oh, well, it's getting sun. Well, there's a certain type of sun that the plant has to get. You have to put them in a south facing window with at least eight hours or more direct sunlight. Now, if that south facing window does not get direct sunlight for at least eight hours a day, you're not gonna do your plants any justice and not gonna get enough light. Um, also, if that south facing window, it has to be, it has to give enough light for the plant to be kind of surrounded by light. It can't be like just one side is getting light and the other side isn't um, because that's still not enough light. What you would have to do in that instance, you have to keep rotating the, the tray around throughout the day so that the light can be evened out. If not, what will happen is the plants will start to grow into a lean to grow towards that light. Um, but if your window is not a south facing window, your plants are gonna struggle in any other type of window. Um, so you don't want to put them in a window unless you know for sure it's a south facing. It's going to get eight hours of light and it's going to get eight hours of direct sunlight that's going to encompass the whole plant. If you don't do that, your plants are going to suffer. Okay, so say you did buy grow light. This agro bright grow light is one I recommend people purchase. You can actually get this on Amazon. You can get it off uh, my Amazon Um I have an influencer account that you can purchase things that I recommend. Um, I'll put the link in the uh, uh, the comments later because I, I can't remember the, the link right now. Um, but it's called AgroBright. It's a T5 uh, high output fluorescent light. Um, and it, it can actually, if you want to grow your plants indoors and things, especially like over the winter or if you're trying to do hydroponics, it'll take the plant from seed all the way to fruiting. Um, I've grown a lot of things under these particular lights. Um, but if your light is not close enough, you will have where well, you'll have that leggy growth also. So uh, plants that are too far away from their light source, new, new seedlings should not be no more than three inches away from their light directly over top of them. It has to be directly over top. It can't be on the side. It can't be leaning back, whatever, because whatever direction the light is in, that's the plant, the way the plants are going to grow. So if you put it over top of them, they're going to grow straight up. If you put them off to the side, they're going to either lean to the left or the right, depending on which side the light is on. And you're going to have these bent plants that could eventually look very leggy. <clears throat> so any questions about lights? Before we talk about some watering and dryness issues. So if you live in a warm environment um, and you can put your plants outside, that'd be great. Uh, and they'll get that sunlight and things that they need if you can put them directly outside. Um, but if you live in an environment like here in Ohio, you know, we're just entering into, we're entering into, an, into uh, spring right now, but our weather can be very unpredictable. So, you know, one day it might be 71 degrees, but at night it might be down to 28. 28 is way too cold for any type of plants. It would kill any seedlings that you put out there. So uh, you basically, if you live, say, like, you know, I know Texas recently had a freeze, but for the most part, usually this time of year, they start to warm up and, you know, their night temperatures are around 55, 60. That would be fine to put those plants outside and allow them to grow in their little pots until you're ready to transplant them out into your garden. Um, but, again, you have to know your environment. You have to know where you, what zone you live in. You can go to the USDA website and you can go to the USDA hardiness zone and they'll tell you what zone you live in. And that'll tell you, give you an estimate of when your last frost will be for the spring and when the first frost will be for the fall. So then you know your time frame that you will be able to plant things. And, uh, and then that'll tell you also um, what things will grow in your area. Using that uh, zone that you live in, um, It'll tell you, like, you know, when you go and purchase seeds or you go and purchase plants, it'll say, well, what zone do you live in? Or it'll say these plants are good for zone three all the way up to nine. And if you know what zone you live in, like here in Cincinnati, it's zone 6A. Part of a 6A is part of a 6B, depending on where you live. Um, it'll tell you, like, these plants will do well in this area because they, they are adapted to living in this zone. <clears throat> All right, so uh, another lighting issue is dried or crunchy leaves. Uh, too much light on a plant uh, or a plant's touching lights can cause uh, the, the uh, light to actually burn that plant. Um, as a plant grows, you need to move that light up. 
also when you're when you're okay when you have your plants indoors and you're allowing them to get to a certain size before you transplant them outdoors um you're supposed to do what is called hardening off this this is where you take that tray of plants that have been growing under fluorescent light and you let them sit outside for a few hours each day for about a week to 10 days so they can be adjusted to this new environment you know if it's in your house or like in your basement or something you baby them so they you know the temperature has been you know kept at a constant temperature they've had light for so many hours a day um they have been watered you know all these types of things that you did for them when you put them outside it's a shock to some plants and so what will happen is if you directly take your plants out from a fluorescent light and you put them outside a lot of times they'll just flop over um and because you know, it's too much sun, it's too much, you know, too much difference in humidity, temperature, you know, outside, it, it's a temperature, one temperature during the day, and then at night it gets cooler, the plant hasn't had an opportunity to adjust to that. So that's why you want to harden them off, you want to allow them to get adjusted to being outside. Um, but this dried and crunchy thing is if, uh, if you put them outside, sometimes they can get burned by the sun. Uh, if they haven't been hardened off, and you'll see where the light, the the leaves look like there's a white spot on there. Um, the plant will eventually recover, but um, what'll happen is is that it has it has to go through this whole phase of creating new leaves and things. And so, if you just harden it off, you want to experience that burnt leaf by the sun. You want to experience this light burn. If you're paying attention to the plants and how they're growing, if they're getting too close to the light, you want to just lift it up to where they're not touching it. All right, I'll see you later, uh, Keith Spears. Uh, thank you for the support. All right, so water issues. Uh, both too much and not enough water can be devastating for your plants. Uh, the pH of water can also affect nutrients uh, dissolving in the water and plants' ability to absorb those nutrients. So people don't understand how important pH is uh, when it pertains to plants. Um, most plants grow in an acidic environment, um, and if you don't have that correct pH, there's a lot of nutrients like calcium, phosphorus, and things that can't dissolve in the water that you're watering the plants with, and so then the plants can't get those nutrients, and so then the plants are going to suffer. Um, so some watering issues, not enough water. You need to regularly check your soil for moisture. If your soil is dry, it is time to water your plants. Not enough water, uh, plants will first wither, then dry up, and then they die. If the environment you have your plants in is warm, the water will be utilized by the plants and also evaporate very quickly. Uh, sometimes it's necessary to sub-irrigate, so that means water from the bottom, like you put them in a tray and you fill that tray up and you let that water soak up from the bottom instead of watering on the top. Um, and that allows the, the soil to uh become moist throughout and not just at the top surface it'll 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 uh distribute that water throughout the uh pot that you have it in so also you can water your plants too much and this is a this is a major problem that i see with people when they first start out they think a plant needs to be watered every day and so they're watering these plants every day and they're systematically drowning it um and what happens is your system can have too much water and not enough oxygen uh, Basically, roots have to breathe. They do breathe. They breathe in oxygen. Um, so you'll need to aerate the area. If you, So I, I did this presentation. It was for hydroponics, so I forgot to change this out. Um, but in your soil, you know, there's oxygen in the soil and things. Uh, say if you had it in the ground, you have things like worms that are creating channels and they're allowing airflow and things to come to those roots or whatever. But if you're constantly watering, watering the plants, they're constantly in water and you're not providing any type of oxygen to that water, these roots will end up drowning and you'll experience what is called root rot. Uh, so for the surf, the, surf, <laughs> the symptoms that you'll see are drooping, yellowing of leaves, and then the roots will rot. They'll turn brown. Uh, the plant will start to, it'll start to smell really bad because it's dying and it's rotting. Um, this root rot can actually attract fungus gnats. And uh, people I talk about, they have gnats that are always flying around their plants. Uh, it's usually because they're overwatering the plants and that those roots and it, it, if any leaves or anything fall down in there and they're rotting or decomposing, that 
uh, fermentation is what attracts those fungus gnats. They lay their eggs in there and then their larva will feed on those roots that you know may still be alive on the plant. Uh, they'll definitely be feeling, feeding on the, the, uh, the, the roots that are rotting, um, but that those larva feeding can actually um, kill the plant. So you want to be mindful of that. You want to make sure you're not overwatering. Also, if you overwater, you can have problems with mold and algae growing on your so soil surface, and that can affect your plant's growth as well. All right, so we're talking about pH real quick. Uh, most plants have a pH range they grow best at between 5.5 to 7, 7.5. 7.5 is kind of pushing it for most plants. Most plants like an ideal range of 5.5 to 6.5. Almost all plants grow in an acidic environment. They don't grow in a basic environment because once you get to a basic pH, the, uh, the plants will start to suffer because a lot of their biological processes require a acidic environment to be in. Um, when they carry out photosynthesis and things, those, those processes need to be in a certain pH for them to be able to carry those out. Um, if the pH is too basic or alkaline, are too acidic, the plant cannot carry out the biological processes and this affects growth. Nutrients, the plant's needs are soluble at certain pH. Uh, you want to test your soil's pH or if you're growing a hydro, your system's pH frequently and especially during nutrient changes. Or in this case, if you're going to you know, grow your plants in soil, you want to check the pH before you go and give them, uh, say you're going to start giving fertilizer or anything, you want to make sure that pH of that soil is correct. Um, so you want to review nutrient pH records. Uh, I have a, I had a, a lecture that I did about that. Um, but basically, these are the nutrients that a plant would need. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, boron, copper, zinc, and molybdenum. Uh, these are all nutrients that a plant would need, and they all have a pH range that uh, they're soluble in water. Once you move out of that pH range, whether you go, go, you know, very acidic or if you go basic, they won't dissolve in the water. And so then the plant will not be able to get it. So then if you can't get the nutrients that it needs, then you're going to have a plant that's not going to grow right because it's not getting all of what it needs to grow. <clears throat> all right. So these are some plants that you can easily grow in one season. Um, I know people, they want to grow. They get excited when they first start their first garden and they want to grow apple trees and all this stuff. Those things take time. And then you also have the right, you got to have the right space. You got to have the right, if you're going to grow in containers, you got to have the right kind of container. People always, they want to grow these lemon trees. Lemon trees, they will not grow in Ohio. You can't leave that tree outside. So when wintertime comes, you have to bring that plant in. There's a lot of problems that people encounter when they start bringing plants in because uh, a lot of creatures outdoors make those that soil, the plant itself, the things in their home. And then when you bring them in, you're bringing them in with it. Um, but these are some plants that you can grow easily in one year. You'll get a harvest. Uh, they're very prolific. They'll produce a lot of fruit and things like that, or they'll produce a lot of leaves if it's a vegetable. Uh, but an example would be for growing nightshades, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, and peppers. You can grow all those in one season. Uh, uh, curcubits, uh, these are the squash, uh, pumpkins, cucumbers, zucchini, um, zucchini squash, and yellow squash. You can all you can grow those. Those grow very fast. Uh, you can grow allium, which are onions and garlic. You can grow leafy greens like lettuce, as well as like collard greens, kale. Uh, you can grow herbs like basil and things like that. They'll all grow in one season. Um, you can grow strawberries in one season. You can grow watermelons and other melons in one season. You can grow okra. You can grow beans, greens, uh, green beans, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and even corn. So any questions? So if you're going to grow plants that you're going to get to fruit, uh, this will be, you know, your tomatoes, your strawberries, your squash plants, um, your okra, things like that. They're going to produce a flower. You have to pollinate that flower, and then that flower will swell into a fruit. Um, I have a whole video explaining about fruits and vegetables because some people are under pressure things like, you know, tomatoes because they're not sweet or peppers. They're not fruits, but in reality, they are because they contain seeds. But to get those 
to to develop, a flower has to be pollinated. Some flowers are self-pollinating, but others require a little bit of work. So say if you're going to try to grow a tomato or a pepper, you have to go if 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 you don't have a lot of you know bumblebees and things in your area that will frequent these flowers, you have to go out there and hand pollinate. Um, so with tomatoes and things, you just go out there and kind of shake the plant, the pollen and the uh, uh, female part of the plant are in a, within the same flower. So if you shake the plant, that pollen will fall in the female parts of the flower and then it'll uh, swell, create that fruit, and you can harvest it once it's ripe. Now, if you're growing things like a squash plant, in the middle I have a uh, cucumber here. Um, basically, you'll have two different types of flowers. That is female flower that has little tiny cucumber behind it, or say you were growing a pumpkin or you are growing a squash plant. You'll have this little bitty fruit, and then you'll have a flower up here. The flower open up, then you have male flowers, they actually do not have this. It just has a long stem and it's a yellow, yellow flower. But you can take like a paintbrush. You can pick up pollen from the male flower and then transfer it to the female flower. And that will do what is called hand pollination. Um, so you can do this with a number of plants. Um, but things like the uh, squash plants and things, you're going to have to hand pollinate if you don't have, you know, bees and things coming in to pollinate it. Same thing with the... Uh, with the okra, you can hand pollinate that as well, um, but that also has flowers similar to the tomatoes, where if you, if you shake it a little bit, the uh, pollen will drop down on the female parts and it'll pollinate it and produce that okra fruit. All right, so we talked about fungus mats a little bit, but this is going to be probably the main uh, insect that you guys are going to deal with. Uh, <clears throat> especially starting your plants indoors. Um, fungus gnats, they belong to the order Diptera, so they're true flies. They're related to mosquitoes, uh, house flies, and fruit flies. Uh, fungus gnats are small flies that look like fruit flies. They infest soil, compost, and other decomposing organic matter. They can become a real problem in hydroponic systems, but they also become a real problem in soil as well, especially if you're overwatering your plants. Um, Plants commonly grown in coconut core or peat can have real problems with fungus gnats because those substrates, that soil um, that you use, or that, um, you know, what you're using as soil, it's a plant and it's decomposing uh, when your watering is breaking down and that can attract these gnats. So adult flies, they are not the problem because they don't even feed. The problem is the larva, like we had talked about earlier. Um, basically, fungus gnats larva can also be found in root plugs uh, and, or in rock wool substrates commonly used in hydroponic systems. They can also be found in soil. I guess last year people were buying soil and the fungus gnats were living in the soil. So if the soil had organic matter in it, had compost in it, most likely it had fungus gnats in there. Uh, whether the bag got you know ripped open a little bit and allowed flies access or, you know, they had the bag sitting outside, a, a hole got torn into it and allowed those flies to get in there. But however it was, they started breeding in there. And so you had to deal with, you know, fungus gnat infestation. And these larvae, like I said, they will feed on the roots. They'll feed on the roots that are rotting, but they'll also feed on healthy roots as well. Um, and they can damage the plant and they can even kill it. So then we have a plant down here that has been damaged by uh, fungus gnat larvae. Um, but these are what they look like. They're little white maggots with little black heads. So if you ever see these in your soil, uh, you'll know that they uh, are present. And if you see the adults flying around, then you know you have a problem. So the control fungus gnats, you want to buy these sticky traps. Um, they're very effective against the adults. The adults are attracted to yellow, so they'll get stuck to this uh, sticky trap. And then you want to clear any plant matter from around the plant. Uh, any any dead plants that you have there, you want to pull them out. Uh, any plants that, you know, um, where the roots are starting to rot, you probably want to get rid of that plant. And then you want to add uh, uh, a bacteria called Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, and you can usually do this with these mosquito dumps. Like I told you, they're related to mosquitoes. 
um, but this will work on fungus gnats as well. Uh, you can crumble this. They also have some mosquito, what I call mosquito bits. You can sprinkle that on top of the soil and water it in, and then don't water the plant for a few days, let the soil kind of dry out. Um, but this bacteria will actually kill the larva. All right, any questions? I just want to show you guys a few things um, that you're going to need to start your plants. Okay, so we're going to go over here. Okay, so I have, if you, if you guys ever want to grow potatoes, you're going to go to the store and you're going to purchase these, what are called seed potatoes. So these are potatoes that have already had the eyes developing on here, and you're going to take these, and this is what you're actually going to plant. But the way you do this is that you take the seed potatoes and you'll cut wherever you see these eyes growing, so you ever see these little plants growing out of here, these will develop new plants. You're going to cut this off. And let it sit for like two days in a you know not dry but kind of a moist environment kind of kind of cool uh not too hot and you're going to let it callous over where you cut it off and then you're going to take that and you're going to plant that and i have some videos where i've demonstrated how to plant potatoes and things like that um but that's how you grow potatoes now if you're trying to grow things like garlic i'm not garlic and onions uh, for onions, you'll buy what are called onion sets. So they look like these little tiny onions, and you'll plant these onion sets. Or with onions, you can actually grow them from seed as well. You can plant the seeds. Um, you can buy those in a little packet. Um, onions and garlic, they take a long time to grow. It's usually 90 days or more. Um, so a lot of times when it comes to garlic, what you'll do is you'll plant the garlic cloves the fall before. So if you were going to grow garlic for this year, if you want to get a decent sized garlic, you would have planted them last fall uh, before the, the first frost. Um, you get them in the ground, cover them up, depending on what zone you live in, determine that you need to mulch in that area, things like that. But as soon as the ground temperatures start to rise in the uh, spring, what will happen is those garlic plants will start to grow up and uh, by you know July, mid July, you can actually harvest your garlic because they'll have enough time when they've grown, you know, over the winter, uh, and then early spring they got that early spring before uh, you know people can go outside and actually plant stuff. Um, for your uh, hand pollination, you want to buy like a little paintbrush, or you can use a Q-tip and things like that. Uh, this is help you transfer that. Um, the pollen from the male to the female, if you want to hand pollinate. Um, here's a pH kit that you can purchase. Uh, they sell them, you know, at Home Depot, Lowe's, places like that. But you can also find them on Amazon, eBay as well. It'll test for different chemicals. Um, but you can also send a soil sample in to your uh, state. Um, they have a whole department that tests soil. And they'll test soil quality. Sometimes uh, if they're, if they, you know, in the beginning, like in spring, they, they become very busy because everybody's sending in soil samples. Um, but this will give you a good idea of where, if you plan to plant somewhere, you'll test like three different parts in that area to get a, a you know, an average of what the pH and things may be in that area, uh, what nutrients are needed and things like that. So you can go and figure out what fertilizers and things you need to purchase. Um, if you're going to start seedlings, I would recommend that you buy a seedling heat mat. Uh, this is very recommended if you're trying to grow pepper plants. Uh, pepper plants, they like a high 
uh, temperature. They usually will sprout at like 85 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, most people are not going to have their house that hot. You know, I, I wouldn't mind. I like being warm. Um, but for the most part, people's houses are going to be a lot cooler than that. And so what that does, that delays the seeds actually sprouting. If you purchase one of these mats, you can get your pepper seeds uh, to sprout in your little seedling trays with a uh, one of those humidity domes over top of it. Um in about a week versus if the temperature's not right, it can take them a month or more to actually sprout. And you don't have that type of time when it comes to peppers and tomatoes. You need those to sprout as soon as you start planting them in, you know, uh before that frost, you need at least six to eight weeks of growth that's before you can transplant them outdoors. So you can be sure that they'll actually produce fruit for you during this season. Um, say you want to grow strawberries, uh, you can purchase these. Um, I got these from that uh, Menards, but you can get these from Home Depot. Uh, sometimes Walmart sells them. A lot of nurseries and things, they'll have what are called tomato, uh, I'm sorry, strawberry bare root plants. They'll also have uh, started strawberry plants, but basically a bare root plant. Is a plant that grew last year and they dug it up once it went dormant um and this is this is what you would actually plant these uh trying to get them apart without tearing them up you can also find seeds and bare roots and other plants and things on uh, ebay i bought a lot of things from farmers and uh providers on eBay. You can also find them on, you know, internet, uh, nurseries and things like that. Uh, but this is what a bare roots strawberry plant looks like. So basically you would plant this, um, and you'll plant it up to the crown here. Um, I have some instructions on how to plant these if you're wanting to learn how, um, you plant it up here, you water it. Uh, what will happen is the plant, uh, once it's ready to start growing, uh, Leaves and stuff will come out here and then it'll flower and then it'll produce those fruits uh, when they're pollinated. Again, you're going to have to have a pollinator present. If not, you're going to have to hand pollinate. So say you don't have, uh, you know, seedling trays. Um, you can use things like uh, when you go have takeout and they have those clear uh, lids and things. You can use those containers to start seeds in. You can remove the top. Uh, the top you want the you want the top on there, especially when you're first starting your seeds. Your a lot of seeds need high humidity, and so this creates like a little greenhouse. Um, this was like some trays that came from some bagels, uh, like offices when they get when they have parties or you know breakfast parties and things, and they get bagels. Uh, you can buy these containers, or they bought these containers, and you can just take them and you can use them as a uh, you know, a container to actually start your plants in. <clears throat> but there's also, you know, they sell all types of trays. Um, you can buy these different types of trays. The size would be dependent on the type of plant you're going to grow. So if you're going to start like lettuce plants or something, you can do what's called plug trays. We can start off a whole bunch of seeds in a tray like this at once and then once they start to grow out, you can transplant them into these bigger containers. Um, uh, so they'll have room for those, those roots and things to expand out. Um, and so the plant doesn't get root bound and that doesn't stunt the growth. And then once they get so big, hopefully it's time for them to go outside. So then you can just take them out of the bigger container and then transplant them outdoors. But these trays come in different sizes. And like, I would use this one to start, say, like tomatoes. You can start tomatoes in those plug trays, but then you're definitely going to have to transplant them to something bigger. You can also start things like pepper plants in here, uh, zucchini plants, uh, sunflowers, all types of stuff. These are bigger. They get about three inches wide. So it gives a plant a, enough space to expand its roots and grow. Um, and also you want to get trays so that you can uh, 
water this plant, sub irrigate. This one actually has holes in the bottom, but they have a lot of these that do not have holes. Um, and what you can do, you can sub irrigate. So that means you can fill this tray up with water, put water in the bottom of here, and then say you had your, your uh, uh, seedling um, inserts. So say you had this have some, uh, soil here. And I'll show you the bag of soil that I recommend that you purchase if you have an anars in your area. It's called ProMix. If not, you can get any type of all-purpose uh, soil that has compost that's good for starting seeds or starting in containers. Um, but basically, if you had these little trays here, you could fill them up. You could put them in this tray. And you can fill this water up in the in the bottom of here, and what will happen is the water will get absorbed from the bottom, and that's what is called sub-irrigation. And that will allow the plants to suck up that water, um, and then you don't have to water from the top. Because a lot of times you water from the top, what happens is you'll start to get fungus and stuff growing on the top of the, of the, the soil or algae, and like I say, that can affect your plant growth. Um... Hey, Chandler, can you come fix this bag? <laughs> so I'm going to show you the bag of soil that I recommend that you purchase. It's called... <laughs> oh, that's right there. You can see it. Just scoot it over a little. It's called... So you, so you can see the words. It's called ProMix. Um, again, you can purchase this at Menards. Uh, I've seen it on Home Depot's website. Um, I don't know if they actually have it in the store. I've never actually seen it in the store, but you can purchase this online and then pick it up from the store. But it's a very nice soil. It's really light. This is what, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's really good for starting seedlings. It's also good for starting your container gardens. You can use this in the containers. You can see it has organic matter in there. That's what your plants are going to need. That's how they get their nutrients from that organic matter to compost. Um, so you want to make sure that you get a good soil, especially if you're doing it in containers or you're growing in a raised bed. Uh, if you're growing in the ground, you can actually you know, mix this soil in into your soil to improve your soil if you have bad soil after you get it tested and things. Um, but yeah, this is the soil I recommend. Um, you can get these little seedling trays. And like I say, you can just take these and fill them up. And then, you know, whatever seeds you're going to start, you would take your seeds. So these are some zucchini plants. And you would just stick them down in here. And I have a whole video on my uh, YouTube channel explaining... Uh, how to understand and read seed packets, especially if you've never actually went and purchased seeds. Um, also, if you get SNAP benefits, even those PEBT cards, um, you can use those uh, benefits to actually purchase seeds um, or started plants. So say you don't want to go to this seed, uh, preparing seed route. You can go to the store, say like Walmart or something that actually accepts EBT, and you can... Uh, purchase already started strawberry plants, already started uh, tomatoes and peppers, um, and then you can plant those directly out into your garden. You don't have to go through that whole process of hardening off and all that stuff. Those plants are ready to go. As soon as that last frost hits, um, you can plant those outdoors, and then you can be ready to start your garden. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so did anybody have any questions about starting a garden, troubleshooting? Anybody having any issues? Has anybody ever have they started their garden already and having issues? I can answer those questions for you now. Are you having issues with any types of insects? Mm 
<clears throat> so the question was, can you tell me how to calculate cubic feet of soil to gallons? Um, so there's actually a calculator. If you type in Google, you can, there's a calculator that actually does that for you. If you type in uh, exactly what you asked, convert cubic feet to gallons, you, you'll, uh, it'll pull up these different calculators and then it'll ask you the dimensions of your container. And then from those dimensions, it'll tell you how much uh, soil is needed to add to your containers. So yeah, there's already calculators that are out there that do that for you. Uh, what are you planning on growing? Um, any tips? Yes, I would recommend that you grow the plants that I suggested. Um, let me pull this back up again. I recommend that you grow some of these plants, um, especially since this is your first year. Things like tomatoes, peppers, um, okra, potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn, things like that. They will grow this one year, um, this, this first year, and you'll get a pretty decent yield. Uh, I would recommend that you figure out what zone you're in so you make sure you're growing the right varieties of these plants so that you don't have any problems. Uh, say, say you're growing the wrong type of uh, strawberry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, potato in your area because you know you might live up north and you might have picked a, a potato that does better in the south. Uh, so you wanna make sure you know what your zone is. <clears throat> Okay, so Midnight Queen said, yes, insects from time to time from store-bought soil. Yeah, I talked about the main insects you're probably going to encounter, which is fun gnats, um, but there's other things that live in there that are not, that may not be insects. It could be things like peel bugs, or they call them roly-polies. It could be millipedes. Um, you must think that this soil, you know, it's, it's if it gets, if a, if a crack or a tear gets into the bag and the soil has like, um, you know, organic matter in there, it's going to attract the things that help break that down. Uh, if it has like, you know, pieces of plants that are, you know, being used as compost, those insects and things are going to come in to break those down. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're causing any harm to the soil, they're not doing that. They're doing what their nature intended for them to do. They, they wanted them to break that down. They're actually doing you a justice because as they're breaking that down and returning nutrients to that soil that your plants can actually utilize. Um, but yeah, you will have to tell me what insects they are, but it sounds like it's probably going to be a lot of those what are called detritivores. The These are ones that break uh, this organic matter down. Um, so that, you know, microorganisms can further break it down and send those nutrients back to the soil for the plants to utilize. So she said, so far I've started broccoli, beets, cucumbers, and a bunch of herbs. Cool. Um, yeah, those, those are really good plants to start on the first, gar uh, first community garden. Um, 
is the garden who's going to be running the garden is it going to be mostly adults it's going to be children a combination are any of these people like skilled or is this the first time they ever done this before so what is a good fertilizer for a vegetable garden well basically it would depend on what type of plants you're going to grow um but if you get uh good quality soil with compost in there you should have to really utilize a lot of fertilizer if the if the soil is already a good quality soil to begin with. Um, but some things that you can do, you can add um, earthworm castings to the soil. Uh, some people add things like um, potash, blood meal. It depends on what you're what you're growing. Um, uh, certain plants require you know higher levels of nutrients than others. If you're growing like leafy greens, you're going to have, you want to have a lot of nitrogen. If you're growing tomatoes, you're going to have a lot of nitrogen in the beginning, but you're going to kind of back off that nitrogen uh, when they start to fruit and flower, but you're going to have to increase calcium and things. So it depends on what you're growing, the stage the plants are at, um, and what you're trying to get your final result to be based off the fertilizer. So I can't give you one, uh, one recommended brand because there's different things for different plants. Midnight Queen. She said, cool, that makes sense. Cool. Um, is it Marissa? If I said that wrong, I apologize. It's an established garden for adults. <coughs> There's even a sign up if there if you are anywhere or anywhere, so I want to water for you. Okay. So they're all are they all growing their own plants or like you're just growing a subset of plants and everybody's tending to this one group of plants. Are they like, they have their own little raised beds or how, how is it set up? Some other things you gotta be mindful for outdoors are uh, wild, wildlife beyond just the insects. Um, you have to be mindful of things like deer, groundhogs, squirrels, um, you know, even cats and dogs, cats will come in and, you know, utilize your space as a litter box. Um, that can be, you know, some problems when they're using it as a litter box and, you know, feces can have all types of diseases. Uh, sometimes cats come in and dig things up. So do dogs, um, things like squirrels, depending on the plant, sometimes they'll, they'll steal like your tomatoes and stuff. Birds, if you're growing like sunflowers, when the sunflower seeds start to develop, uh, they will uh, start to eat your sunflower seeds. So um, you got to be mindful of the wildlife. You also got to be mindful about people and who's coming in there. Uh, have you know some type of biosecurity because people can bring things into there. They can bring uh, microorganisms like fungi and viruses on their clothes and things that can actually affect the, uh, affect the plants. Uh, they can bring in insects uh, if they're going to start. OK, so I, I see you're saying um, it's an established garden and you said everyone can have their own four by foot, uh, four by eight raised bed. The perimeter is fenced. Um, so are they all getting the plants directly from you? Or are they bringing in their own plants? Because they're bringing in their own plants. That can be a problem as well, um, because their plants could be infested with insects. Uh, or, you know, fungi, viruses, that bunt bacteria that can, you know, make other people's plants sick. So it may be that you want everybody to get their plants from, you know, say everybody's going to start all their seeds together and they're going to be kept in one place or they're going to purchase their plants from this one particular place or whatever. So that that cuts down the exposure of bringing in, you know, um, microorganisms and things that could affect the plant's growth. So yeah, like, I'm sorry I can't give you a, a, a straight answer about the fertilizer because there's different types of fertilizer and it depends on what you plan to grow. So once you have a list of what you plan to grow, um, you can send me an email or something and I can recommend uh, some things for that. 
Um, but like I say, every plant has, you know, some plants have different pH, some plants at different stages need different things. Um, so you have to know that uh, some plants, you know, you can just use the compost. Uh, the nutrients in the compost are good enough for it because you're not trying to take it beyond a certain point. If you're trying to grow herbs and stuff, a lot of times you're just going to utilize the leaves. So you don't need it to flower and fruit and all that. So you don't need, you know, incorporate all these extra nutrients to get that plant to that level versus you want to you know, you're growing a watermelon, you want to make sure you're getting the vegetative growth in the beginning to make sure you got enough nitrogen. But when it starts to flower and fruit, you want to make sure you get enough phosphorus and potassium, as well as calcium and some other nutrients to help with that uh, fruit development. Um, so we have to know what you're actually trying to grow uh, as far as your plants. All right, any other questions, you guys? No questions? Okay, well, that's the end for tonight. Um, if you have any questions, you can send one of us at Agricademy an email. My email is Nadia Ruffin at agricademyinc.org, or you can send an email to Chandler Glover at agricademyinc.org, and uh, we can help you, you know, get your gardens and if you have questions about getting started. Now, we do offer classes um, for different things. We have, you know, classes teaching you how to grow, a multitude of different things. They are charge classes, um, but if it's like a basic question, um, you know, we can probably help you out with that, or we'll say we recommend that you take that class. Um, but if you guys don't have any other questions this evening, I'm going to sign off, and I thank you guys for uh, tuning in. Um, I'll be back soon uh, presenting some other important information as it pertains to agriculture. So you guys have a good evening, and good night. <laughs>